All right, welcome everyone to our third seminar talk. I am Daniel, I will be introducing our speaker, which is Dr. Wei Huang. She is with the Institute of Earth and Environment and the Department of Earth and Environment. She's here to talk to us about estuarine dynamics modeling. And a lot of her research focuses on understanding how coastal climate processes interact with the greater ecosystem and then modeling those things. Because one of our key approaches is not just identifying mechanisms of change, but is understanding them. And through that understanding, how do you model them? And then a lot of that understanding comes from dynamic models. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I believe the title is going to be Studying Form Driven Hydrodynamics in a Semi Closed Estuary by Field Measurements and Numerical Simulation. So st st simulation. Sorry, it's been a long day. Dr. Wong is a oceanographer, a modeler, and observer. She is someone that understands through observing most of the name of process and is able to effectively generate models from them, various mathematical processes, which I hope to see today. So without any further ado, I started last year in August, so I'm a new faculty here, but I, I'm not new anymore to some of you uh, because I've uh, met a lot of you uh, previously during the last semester and during the lunch today. And uh, it's very nice to see you here. Thank you for joining me today um, because this is a, a graduate seminar. And uh, I know in the audience, a lot of you are uh, graduate students. Some of you may just get started. Uh, you're trying to find out uh, which direction you, you would like to go. Some of you may um, approach to the end, uh, trying to publish some papers. So today in my uh, presentation, I'm gonna uh, talk about my previous research experience in studying the storm-driven hydrodynamics to share of my um, so use myself as an example to uh, show you how I conducted research while I was a, a PhD student at Louisiana State University. And uh, now let's get started. Uh, before. Uh, when I first got started for my PhD study, I was provided a few options by my PhD advisor. And I chose the one that is studying the influence of coastal passages on the coastal waters along the northern Gulf of Mexico as my topic areas. And why studying the coastal passages is so important? That is because a lot of Previous studies have shown that the coast front passages uh, have great impact on the subtidal variation, especially for the water systems along the northern Gulf of Mexico, where the type of the tides is macro tides. And sometimes the uh, changes induced by the coast front passages even is even larger than the tidal variation. And then uh, by looking at these two surface weather maps here, one is for the hurricane, the other one is for coast front, we can see that uh, even though the wind stress is, the wind is intensity is less uh, of a, a coast front compared with that during a hurricane. The coast front has a larger spatial scale uh, because it's uh, originated from a low pressure sensor in the Arctic zone. The front system can extend it to the whole uh, U.S. continent. Uh, besides that, um, before and after a coast front passage, we can experience dramatic changes in atmospheric forcing like air pressure, uh, humidity, uh, temperature, and also wind uh, directions and the wind magnitude. Uh, so um, because the great impact of the coast front passages on the subtidal variation, it's good to look at how the wind associated with the coast front passages drive the uh, coastal water systems and the two, by checking the hydrodynamics of the coastal water, water systems. Then uh, in one of my previous study, I counted 1,648 coast front passages over the past a few decades. And uh, uh, we, in last study, we found that there is an increasing trend in terms of the number in each year, the number of the coast front passages in each year um, over the past de decades. So which yield like, so in, in recent years, we have eight more coast front passages when compared with uh, 40 years before. Now let's look at my study area. It is a lake estuary called Lake Pontchartrain, and it is in the northern uh, side of the big city New Orleans in Louisiana. 
it is semi-enclosed because the connection to the open ocean are mainly through three very narrow inlets. Is very limited connection to the open ocean make the lake less semi-enclosed. Then the lake is large, it is shallow, the average depth is about only four meters. Because, because of the limited connection to the open ocean, the salinity is also very low. The average salinity value is about four. And then, um, at first, when I, when I start my research, uh, my provides, my advisors shared me, uh, some data sets. And the, some of those are obtained from the ADCP deployment, including the water level and the velocity in the three inlets. And that is obtained in 2008. After that, uh, we, we decided to go to the lake again to collect more data. So we deployed a few hobo pressures, uh, water pressure sensors around the lake. And uh, the, the hobo pressure sensor, uh, were uh, located at four directions of the lake from set one to set four, representing by the triangles. Now let's look at the, uh, the analysis, how I analyze the observational data. Let's first look at the data I obtained uh, in 2008. So in this figure on the left-hand side, on the top panel, I'm showing uh, four time series. The red line is representing the air pressure. The other four solid line are representing the water level variation at the three inlets. Uh, you can see that the, the, uh, the water level, uh, seems to be more smoother. That is because, uh, I, um, low, I did, I applied a low pass filter for those, uh, time series so that I can only focus on the subtitle variation and exclude the title variation. Um, um, and on the top panel, we can also see five vertical lines, which is in the, indicating the, the date when there was a coast strand event. Correspondingly, I put all the uh, surface map on the on the um, right hand side so that you can know the background, the the, atmos the surface weather maps for each uh, coastline passage. Then on the bottom of the left hand side, I'm showing you the wind vector during that time period. Then, uh, because I'm trying to study how the water level is responding to uh, to air pressure to wind. So let's first look at the oscillation of the variation of the water level. We can find that, uh, except for the second coast friend. After the, the other four coast friend passages, we see that the water level drops after the coast friend passages. However, after the second coast friend passage, the water level increased by half a meter. And why is that? To figure it out, we need to look at, uh, uh, further look at the velocity data. And one thing to be noted that is the, the, there are some common feature for the, uh, cold front passage. Before, uh, the cold front passage, the, the air pressure uh, drops after the cold front passage, the air pressure increases. And then, uh, at the same time, wind changes its direction, uh, mainly from the southern cauldron to northern, northern cauldron in a clockwise way. Excuse me, real quick. Is that a large variation in air pressure? From ten ten to ten thirty. Uh, you mean this place? Yeah, just is that like a, a big change in air pressure? Yes, yes. If you look at the air pressure in, in red lines, there is a big change. That's a big change. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you can notice the big changes in the air pressure after the uh, the third portion passage. It increases a lot. Uh, that is the that, that is the major effect from the coastal passage before pre and after the coastal passages. Now let's look into the velocity. Um, remember the data were obtained from three inlets. However, uh, the, the the ADCP were not functioning very well in the in the three canal. So here I'm only showing you the the, the along channel velocity through two inlets. One is regulates, uh, the other one is shelf meant to. Uh, all those two inlets are to the lake's eastern side. Now, uh, this is a time series, but it is also a vertical profile of the along channel velocity. Uh, the axis, x axis is the time, the y axis is the depth. So we can see the vertical profile of the, of the velocity, uh, by looking at the magnitude, which is shown by the color. Red color means the water is moving into the lake. Blue color meaning the water is moving outside of the lake. So the red color, um, is obviously stands out, um, indicating that the water after the second cold front passage is moving into the lake. 
However, uh, after the other four coastline passage, because the because the uh, color is in blue, that means the water is moving outside of the lake. And if we correspond this, uh, we correlate this uh, flow pattern with the wind vector um, on the on the lower panel. We can see that. After the second coastline passage, it was the easterly wind which was dominating, and uh, this is this this is uh, can be easily imagined that the easterly wind tend to push the water uh, into the lake, uh, making resulting in the inflow of the of the water through the two inlets at the eastern side, and that is also in uh, consistent with the previous slide where we see after the second coastline passage the water level increased a lot. Now, if you look at the other four coastline passage, uh, when the water is uh, uh, moving out of the lake, that is under the northerly wind. Now we have a better sense of how wind dri drives the flow and the water level, uh, how uh, they, how the wind associated with the coastline passage have impact on uh, the hydrodynamics at the three inlets. Now, I'm going to talk about more, more data in uh, which I obtained in 2017. Those are the water depth data obtained from the water hobo pressure sensors at four directions of the lake. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this data set to check how the lake surface oscillates under different wind direction. Uh, to do that, uh, I calculated the, the water difference by, uh, by each pair of the, the sets, the, the water level in two directions. One is in north to south direction, the other one is in east to, uh, to um, west direction, so that I can directly correlate the lake surface slope with the wind stress with the, with different wind components in both directions. Now let's look at the results. Here in the peak, in, in this figure, the upper panel and the lower panel are showing the lake surface slope, the changes of lake surface slope in two directions. Uh, let's first look at the, the upper panel, which is the lake surface slope in south to um, north direction. There are two time series. Both were applied on um, the low pass filter. Uh, so if the, the, the green color is showing the wind components in north to south direction, Positive value means so uh, means it is the southerly wind was dominating. A negative green line means the the, the wind direction is uh, northerly wind, and the, the red color is the uh, lake surface slope. If we look at this time period when um, the southerly wind was dominating, we can see that the set three, which is in the northern side, has higher elevation. And the list can be explained by the, the southerly wind tend to set up a slope in a way that the northern side is higher, the southern side is, is, is lower. That also means the, the southerly wind push the water to the northern side of the lake, making a higher water level at set three. And similarly, we can find that easterly wind tends to push the water to the western side, making a higher water level at set two. And uh, um, if uh, if if I flip the water level difference up and upside down, we we can imagine that the two lines, the wind component and the lake surface slope, can be overlapped with each other. So uh, can I can I do a single calculation by uh, reproducing to reproduce the lake surface slope by only using the wind component? Um, the answer is is yes, and the equation is showing here. So I used this very simple relationship between the uh, water pressure gradient and the wind stress to reproduce the lake surface slope. Uh, and uh, in this in this equation, the first item is the uh, water pressure gradient. The, the second item is the wind stress. So on the top, uh, on the numer uh, numerator of the first item, that is the exactly the um, water water different wa water level difference, which is also the lake surface slope. So I calculated the water, uh, lake surface slope by using this equation and showing it in the figure, which is in uh, black black line. Again, there are in two di directions. The upper panel is uh, the, the slope in the north to south direction. The lower panel is the slope in the west to east direction. And then if you look at the uh, lake surface slope in north to south direction, we can see that uh, the red line and the black line, they are overlapped with each other. And the red line is calculated by using the observational data, which means um, 
by only using the wind component, I can totally um, kind of accurately reproduce the lake surface slope. And that means uh, the lake surface slope is uh, uh, dominated mainly by wind. However, if we look at the lower panel, um, they are still well in line with each other, but um, it's not that consistent as we as we see in the other direction. That is because remember the two inlets connecting to the lake with the open ocean is to is located in, at the eastern side of the lake. That means the uh, the open ocean water tends to destroy this kind of uh, balance between the wind stress and uh, water pressure gradient. And the lab is, uh, and I, I, I propose the balance to be causal statistically balanced. That means even though the wind is changing with time, uh, it can easily set up a slope and the, the lake surface slope changes, oscillates um, together with the wind. So that is a very simple relationship um, between the wind component and the lake surface slope. And that's all about the analysis using the observational data. Um, although I draw some conclusions, I propose this causal status of balance, which I can explain some phenomenon, but I think that that is not enough for me to look at the whole picture of the lake. So in order to look at the whole lake, like the circulations, the stratification of the lake, I employed a numerical model. And the model uh, is using this horizontal grid, which contains more than 6,000 nodes. Uh, one good thing is I can look at every single node with, uh, which provides all those hydrodynamics, including the water level, salinity, temperature, uh, flows, and exactly. The other good thing is by using different boundary condition and the surface forcing, I can easily separate different forcing and check different uh, forcing from the wind, including the remote wind effect and local wind effect. In order to separate the remote wind effect and local wind effect, I'll first introduce the definition. So what is remote wind effect? Remote wind effect is means the, the effect of the wind is coming from, um, from a far region or far beyond the open boundary. So in order to simulate the remote wind effect, I use the observable level, which conclude every forcing from outside and then uh, I, that is the only forcing uh, for driving the drives the uh, model, because the remote wind uh, can in that, in, in that way can be manifested by the observable level. Now let's look at the local wind effect. By its name, uh, the defin the local wind effect is de defined by the direct wind effect uh, forcing at the lake surface. So in order to simulate that, I use the tidal variation forcing at the open boundary with the wind forcing at the surface. And then uh, if we combine the two effects together, that is the real case station, uh, real case simulation. So um, the real case simulation uh, is the more realistic case study. And then it, the model has been validated by a variety of data sets, including the salinity, velocity, water level. That shows a good performance of the model to simulate uh, the hydrodynamics of the lake. Now let's look at the model's results. Uh, because I'm separating the remote wind effect and local wind effect, here I'm showing you uh, two columns and three rows. The left column is the surface flow, the red column is the bottom flow. And then three rows from the top to the bottom are the circulation induced by uh, real case, uh, by local wind and by remote wind, respectively. The color is showing the magnitude of the flow. Now let's look at uh, the first row, which is under the real case simulation. Uh, if we look at the surface flow, we can see that, so this is a snapshot during uh, the period when the northerly wind is dominating. So if we look at the surface flow, we can find that the flow, uh, the surface flow is all moving uh, with the wind's direction from the south, from the north to the south. However, if we look at the bottom flow, we can notice a returning flow in the middle, in the center of the lake where the water depth is deeper. And uh, at the bottom, the bottom layer, if they look at a shallower water zone, like the lake shore zone, um, the flow is still in the direction of a wind. Um, and therefore, as a result, there is a um, sub-mesoscale eddy formed due to the, uh, the, the flow in the direction and the returning flow in the middle of the lake. Uh, especially at the western side of the lake, there is a, there is a eddy formed. Now, let's look at the remote wind effect in the second row. 
So uh, if you look at the color, uh, which is representing the magnitude, we can see that the magnitude in, induced by local wind is much smaller than uh, compared than than the the magnitude under the real case study. However, if we look at the circulation pattern, it seems quite similar with what we see from the real case simulation. That means the local wind is dominating the circulation pattern of the whole lake. And then uh, if we look at the remote wind effect, we can see that there is a no uniform pattern for the, for the circulation. Uh, however, if we look at the magnitude, the pattern of the magnitude is quite similar with, with the real case simulation. And uh, the conclusion here is the uh, remote wind is controlling the magnitude, especially for the region closer to the open ocean. However, the local wind is uh, um, controlling the circulation pattern instead of the lake. So why the remote wind seems only controlling the region closer to the open boundary? To answer that question, I did three sensitivity tests. So here we have two columns. One column is for the surface magnet, uh, surface flow. The, the other column is for the bottom flow. And then we have three rows, uh, which are under three sensitivity tests. In those sensitivity tests, from the top to bottom, I am increasing the Mm, bottom friction drag coefficient. So on the top, I use a very small, a small number for representing the bottom friction, which is ne ne negligible. And then the color is representing the magnitude of the velocity. So we can see that um, the whole lake can be responding to the wind effect very sensitively. Uh, however, when I increase the bottom drag coefficient, uh, you can see that the, the red color representing larger magnitude become uh, limited to uh, the the, op the, uh, the region closer to the open ocean. That tends to explain why the remote wind is uh, uh, damped uh, as it go as we go from the open boundary to the, to to the interior of the lake, and uh, the point here is remote wind um, can be blocked by the bottom friction, and that is a major reason why uh, we only see the effect of remote wind uh, closer to the open ocean. Uh, and after that, I quantified the remote wind effect and the local wind effect by calculating two ratios. Um, on the top of the ratio, it is the uh, current induced by local wind or remote wind. On the denominator, it is the combined effect. So the larger, uh, if we see larger ratio by remote wind, that means remote wind is controlling the loss area. And the, the larger, if the, if the remote wind ratio is larger, that means the remote wind is controlling the specific region. And if uh, and after that, because the three ratio were based on three regions, uh, I divided the the whole lake into three regions: the lake shore region with shallower water, the center of the lake with deeper water, and then the coastal uh, the the open boundary uh, region, which is closer to 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 the open ocean. Now, if you look at the ratios, the, we can see that. Um, the larger, larger rem remote, uh, wind ratio is, is mainly along the lake shore region, uh, which means the local effect only um, control the lake shore region and the, the remote wind effect only control, uh, is controlling the region closer to the open, open boundary. And the red color, um, we see both larger ratio from remote wind and local wind, which means the center of the lake is controlling by both remote wind and local wind. And that's all about the circulation pattern. Um, because the model now is well validated, I'm going to use it to start another um, type of uh, process, which is the freshwater plume. So the freshwater plume is due to the um, due to the operate operation of a man-made structure called Bonnie Carey Spillway to the western side of the lake. Um, it is connecting the lake to the Mississippi River. During the flooding season, the Mississippi River will be diverted into the lake through the Bonnie Carey Spillway. And along with it, there will be a huge amount of freshwater sediment load, as well as some pollutant uh, particles. So I use the model to reproduce it and validate it by comparing it, comparing the freshwater plume with the satellite image, and also by validating it against some observational data we obtained uh, from the lake. 
Now let's look at the results. So here I'm showing you a vertical profile along a transect. The transect is along the line three, which is in east-west direction. And then the two columns, one column is under easterly wind, the other, uh, the other column is under the westerly wind. And we have three rows. The three rows are under different sensitivity tests. Those tests were used to uh, test the, the, the wind magnitude. So basically what I did is I increased the wind magnitude from four meter per second all the way to 12 meter per second. And uh, then uh, let's look at, oh, uh, by the way, the color is showing the salinity. So if we look at the east, uh, western side, um, I don't know why that is. Can you see the red out? Mm -hmm. So from this side, this is the western side, which is closer to the bony carrier spillway. Uh, those are where we see some fresher water because of the diversion of the Mississippi River. And then to the eastern side, it is closer to the open boundary. We can see some higher salinity for those stones. And then uh, previously, I showed you the two-layer flow from a horizontal view. And uh, here, we can also see that kind of two-layer flow in a vertical view. So on the top of the, uh, on the, on the, Upper layer, we see that the flow is in the direction of the wind. On the bottom, there is a returning flow, which is against the, the wind's direction. And as the magnitude of wind goes up, we can see that um, there is a zero velocity plane between the two layers. So we can, we can see as the wind in increases its magnitude, the zero velocity uh, plane is going deeper and deeper. And at the same time, we can also see the flow is stronger as the wind becomes stronger. And the two, uh, and pre previous slide, from, from this slide, we can also see there is um, uh, some water columns which is highly stratified because the, the, the lighter fresh water is floating on the top. And then we have the salt water from the eastern side. Uh, the water uh, for some places are stratified. To look into the stratification of the water column for the whole lake, I did another two sensitivity tests. So two columns here, um, one column is when the bony, uh, the spillway is opened. The other column is when the uh, bony carrier spillway is closed. So uh, there is no fresh water input from the city river. And then three snapshots from the top to the bottom, they are at different stages uh, at, um, for the, the evolution of the fresh water plume. So they are uh, the snapshot at different dates. And then if we look at uh, the condition, the, the left column condition when the bony carrier spillway is open, we can see that there is a, there is a, a bright color. The color is showing the iPad number. The iPad means the average um, potential energy demand. The larger it is, that means the, the, the water column is mo more stratified. It is more stable. So we see that larger iPad, iPad value along, uh, along this this, it's, it's basically a band of larger iPad value. And that band is right located at the edge of the freshwater plume. So that means uh, along the edge of the freshwater plume, the water is more stratified. Uh, <laughs> And, and then as the fresh water expanded into the interior of the lake, the large iPad value band is also moving together with the edge of the freshwater pool. And after that, I uh, use the model results to uh, calculate the, lag, um, the pollutant particles trajectories by examining the Lagrangian tracking. So what I did is I released a certain amount of full pollutant particle through the bony carrier spillway, and then I uh, examined how the trajectory looked like uh, for those pollutant particles. Uh, I did two sensitivity tests here. One on the left is the one under the rail case. The other one is when um, there is no wind. Um, in this way, we can check how the winds it's influence, influencing the uh, particle trajectory. If you look at the condition under the wind, we can see that uh, the trajectory um, is, is again um, moving together with the edge of the freshwater plume. As the freshwater plume uh, evolves, the uh, pollutant trajectory is also going with the edges 
of the fresh water plume. Uh, and then we can also notice that the, the pollutant particles were transported uh, in between the lake and the open ocean through all the three in this. However, if you look at the trajectory under the condition without wind, when wind is excluded, we can see that the particles were mainly transported outside of the lake through the Schaffman tool in its eastern side of the lake. So this is showing us the uh, great e effect from the wind associated with coast ground passages and cut together with the human activity and how the human activities are interacting with the coast ground passages and have impact on the uh, residence time and the uh, pollutant transportation. So uh, that is the, the whole process of my PhD study. And the, from this process, uh, we can see that I started from very simple analysis using the observational data. And then by looking at the observational data, I proposed the concept that the state balance, which is a relationship, very simple relationship between the changing wind and the lake surface oscillation. And after that, I found it's not enough for only look at a few uh, study sets I should use a model to look at the overall view of the lake. So I employ this, uh, the numerical model to simulate the 3D hydrodynamics under baroclinic condition. And then I use the model to, um, to conduct a lot of sensitivity tests to separate different forcing from wind and also to study uh, the, the influence from uh, like the inter interaction between the human activity and coast run passages. And then um, that is the whole process. Uh, I've covered everything I'd like to share. I know um, as you, as a, as a graduate student, as, when you uh, conduct a research, you may uh, feel frustrated. You may stuck in the middle of the process. So if that's happened, go to talk with your advisor first and uh, try to ask questions. Because when you know what ask, what questions to ask, then you have already uh, solved a lot, a large part of the problem. And with that, um, I'd like to take any questions. Thank you. 